of some of our very best biologists to try to understand this and use that information to make a whole new generation of drugs. So let's say an introduction. And with that, I'm going to just read this introduction from the book. The book is available on Amazon. It's also available on my website, williamhazeltine.com. Uh, that's spelled with an S, by the way, williamhazeltine.com. And uh, it's, uh, I think, something that uh, we should be. I'm going to read just first the introduction and then uh, a forward. Why care about viroids and viruses? Viroids and virusoids are small circular infectious RNAs. Sometimes I'll say viruses when I mean virusoids. It's kind of a harder word to say. So viroids and vi viroids and virusoids are small circular RNAs. Think of a virus, but much simpler. All pathogens have their own tools of the trade. That's colas writers, which allow them to infect and transmit between different hosts. Of course, some pathogens have more complex toolkits than others. Viruses are quite minimalist in their approach, but viroids and virusoids are more extreme still. Where all viruses encode at least one protein in their genome used to produce an enzyme that can replicate the virus genetic information, viroids and viricides don't. Instead, they hijack enzymes found within the host cells rather than carrying their own tools. They simply make use of those already present on site. They are also much smaller than viruses. For comparison, SARS-CoV-2, something we all know now, is made up of nearly 30,000 nucleotides. The basic building blocks of RNA and DNA contain only between 220, of viroids anyway, and 450 nucleotides. A lot, lot smaller. That's really small. Yet, um, <clears throat> okay, that's as small as they are. Virusoids are generally smaller than uh, viruses, uh, we're clocking in at about 1,700 nucleotides, still a lot less than most viruses. Um, and so that's the first thing about them is that they're small. There's a theory that maybe life before it was DNA was RNA and these are left over. Or some people think that they are derivatives of RNA. And one of the things we're learning is how diverse RNA is. Roberto Petrarca and I are currently beginning to work on a book it describes all the new things we've learned about RNA. And I can tell you from the time I was a student, he was a student, even 10 years ago, the complexity of what is actually happening inside of cells has grown enormously with respect to our understanding of RNA. And again, that's a reason to understand what viruses are and what viroids are. Uh, they may have come from cells or they may be the actual precursors of all living forms. There's a big debate in the literature, and it's going to take a long time to try to try to resolve that. Um, here's the uh, actual introduction to the book. Um, um, so flip back here a bit. Messenger RNA, as mRNA, has become a key therapeutic modality. Propelled into the spotlight by the COVID-19 pandemic, vaccines are only the tip of the iceberg. There's an mRNA revolution on the horizon. For cancer treatment, and we're beginning to write about this, uh, to gene therapy, to drug development, mRNA will soon be everywhere. And I really think it is the revolution of the future. It is our equivalent of the DNA revolution that's led to more than half of pharmaceutical drugs today and more than half of pharmaceutical sales. You don't just swallow a pill now, you get an injection, you get an infusion, they have proteins, all that is a result of the DNA revolution. Right now, we're in the first stages of the RNA revolution, and it's happening pretty fast. Uh, some of these discoveries were made maybe 10 or 12 years ago, and already people are benefiting from the discoveries. It's like the DNA revolution. 
it was discovered how to manipulate DNA and read a sequence, et cetera, was discovered in the 70s. And there were drugs being introduced into people in the 80s uh, that has led to this giant biotechnology revolution. There's an aspect of this which I think is very interesting. And that is RNA can be chemically made. You don't have to grow it up in large vats. You can actually synthesize it by in very small amounts. So I think a, a room the size of a garage <clears throat> that can make a billion drugs a year. Well, there's a very important implication of that, and that's cost. Right now, all of these biotech drugs cost thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands, sometimes even millions of dollars. I believe that in the future, using RNA to create place our protein, our antibodies, our gene therapy drugs. It can all be done with injections. There's a real cost of manufacturers, 10 or $20. And given the right circumstances, that can be a cost of these drugs, making it accessible to everybody in the world, not just the extraordinarily wealthy people who happen to live in San Francisco, New York, Houston, Miami, et cetera, which is uh, what's happening today with many of these drugs. Um, so the mRNA revolution is something really to pay attention to, not only for your own health, but for the health of the world. From cancer treatment to gene therapy to drug development, mRNA will soon be everywhere. At its core, the idea behind mRNA technology is a simple one. Messenger RNAs are transfected into cells and cause a useful phenotypic change. You put something in, you change the cell, you change the, the way the body behaves, or you make an antibody to what you've made, which is what the vaccines are. Um, but before or long, mRNA was thought as a, as a potential therapeutic drug. Nature divides its own transmissible messenger RNAs, thyroids and virusoids. That's this book. A study of how these small naked mRNAs can be, one, transmitted from one organism to another, enter a target cell, three, migrate from cytoplasm to the nucleus of cells, four, redirect DNA-dependent RNA polymerases to transcribe the RNA, five, in the case of hepatitis D virus, direct the synthesis of its own proteins, and C, transmit um, and, and transit the from the nucleus and cytoplasm to exit the cell and restart uh, the cycle of infection. All of these are lessons we can learn to increase the efficiency of mRNA use drugs. In addition to shedding light on potential futures of mRNA, this book also outlines the relevance of virusoids to the fatal human disease of hepatitis D and encourages us to do a risk a general research on the topic. So that's uh, the book. Now I'm going to describe several other aspects of viroids and uh, virusoids. Um, this is a picture of what a healthy tomato, potato looks like. Most of you understand that. And something that causes a major blight, which was really the source of virusoids. These virusoids could really stunt and cause all sorts of growth abnormalities. And to give you an idea of that, I have here, I think, uh, a list of virusoids and viroids that infect animals. This is just a small picture. We are beginning to learn that these small organisms are much, much more prevalent than we thought. It's almost as if a whole invisible world has been revealed. We've taken the cover off and understood. And the way we do that is we use these modern sequencing technologies to sequence hundreds of thousands of organisms. We put that data in the databases. Then we use our powerful computers, think of chat or AI, uh, to sort through it. Which ones of these are likely to be have some similarity to something we know that's a viroid or virusoid. And when you do that, all of a sudden you find they're everywhere. They're not just what we know about. They're everywhere. Are they causing trouble? Sometimes they're probably peaceful parasites. And sometimes they're probably causing diseases in plants, animals, and us that we don't have an explanation for yet. 
So one of the biggest discoveries just in the last 10 years that we have all this sequence information and we have these powerful computers is how abundant viroids and virusoids are. Now, what is the difference between a viroid and a virusoid? It's whether it makes a protein. And there are some plants, uh, like tobacco, uh, that have are infected by virusoids that make a protein, and that protein carries out some key functions for it. And us, we're infected by hepatitis D virusoid. Now, virusoids, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but first let me talk about how abundant they are. So these things are everywhere. So let me just read from the book some of the plants that are infected. Potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, citrus fruit, um, apples, peaches, pears, hemp, that's cannabis, that's uh, marijuana. And that's going to be a big problem. It's a big problem for U.S. marijuana manufacturers. Uh, palm, which is a major product of uh, uh, oils. Half of Indonesia is devoted now to making palm oil, as well as um, uh, Malaysia and some other countries, even avocados. So these, as an important source of food, are important pathogens. And we don't have very much to combat these. I would say we have no way, really, of combating it, except for hepatitis C, the D. And what we do is hepatitis D, these Hepatitis B, you get around usually. And if you stop hepatitis B, you'll stop hepatitis D, unless you already have hepatitis B. And then you get infected with hepatitis C. That's another thing that can happen. Now, let's see if we can see what happens with animals and people. It turns out, as I showed you, first we thought it was just a few. Now we know that almost all animals have their viroids and virusoids. So that's the second thing, their ubiquity and their ability to cause serious economic harm. Okay, so now let's talk uh, about a different topic. This book really talks about the fundamentals of viruses and virusoids, but it also talks about hepatitis D. Why should we worry about hepatitis B? Well, if you contract hepatitis B and it's not treated, you have about a 10% chance of dying, and you die of liver degeneration, fatty liver, and cancers. If you're unfortunate enough to get hepatitis D and hepatitis B, your chance of dying goes up to 50%. Half of those who get hepatitis D die, and they die pretty quickly. Now, hepatitis D is a little virus, right? We go into it in great detail, and we're still analyzing this genome. And we believe, certainly Roberto Petrarca and I believe, that there is an antisense protein that's also made in addition to the couple of proteins it also made. So people who have the infection of hepatitis B and hepatitis D can carry it. It actually gets packaged into the hepatitis B package and is moved around from person to person. Okay? And so if you stop by either a vaccine or you stop with a hepatitis B D drug, you'll stop transmission. So it is the good news is we can do something about it. However, the other thing that can happen is if you have hepatitis B and you encounter hepatitis D, that can get into you as well. Now, very recently, something quite disturbing has been discovered about hepatitis D. And that is, for many years, we thought hepatitis B could only be shepherded around from one person to another or within the body by hepatitis C. That means only those with hepatitis B could get it, and it was only a liver disease. All of a sudden, we've learned that hepatitis D is pretty nonspecific with what virus carries it around. Flu virus can carry it around. Other viruses can carry it around. And if it carries it around, it's going to get into those other cells and it may cause a disease there. So all of a sudden, there is a new interest in hepatitis C 
not only as a cause of serious liver disease, but maybe other diseases that currently don't have a definition. I'm talking about human disease now. They don't have a definition. What is a causal agent? Some of these diseases, have, especially the brain and other organisms, have no real etiology. We don't understand them yet. Maybe they are also caused by hepatitis D virusoid carried by common cold viruses. Let's say SARS, even long COVID uh, could be in part a result of carrying around hepatitis D viruses or other viroids or virus, especially virusoids uh, throughout the body. So it's really uh, worth looking at. Now there is another hepatitis D, the C drug that could stop hepatitis D all by itself. That's because one of the key things that happens is the hepatitis D virus has to get from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a carrier protein for that. It carries the uh, information from the cytoplasm into the nucleus and across the cell membrane. And there are special carriers that the cell has for that. And some of the new drugs interfere with that carrier, therefore interfere with cellular processes important for hepatitis A life. And not only do they stop hepatitis C, they also stop hepatitis C all by itself. So there are there is some hope for that disease, but it is something that uh, we uh, really have to look about look at in uh, considerable uh, more detail. Mm -hmm.